Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. What you're about to hear is part 10 in a long and winding series on the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. If you're the sort of person who likes to have the full context of a story, you may want to go back and listen to those earlier episodes. If you don't need context and you're comfortable joining us in the middle of the story, then by all means stick around. Last week, I covered the reaction of Soviet soldiers to the Holocaust and narrated the endgame of the Second World War in Europe from a military perspective. This week's episode will be the first of two or three episodes on relations between the Soviet Union and their British and American allies during and after the war, and the origins of the Cold War. At first, I intended to cover this topic in a single episode, but as I sat down to actually write it, I realized the subject is just too big to cover in one episode, so I'm going to break it into several. This is The End of History, Part 10. On February 24th, 2022, Putin's Russia invaded Ukraine in an unprovoked act of aggression against its smaller neighbor. Like much of the world, I was surprised by the invasion. I don't claim to be one of the world's leading experts on Putin and Russia, but I am a keen observer of Russian policy and politics. I was not surprised by the posturing. Russian foreign policy has been characterized by bullying its neighbors in the former Soviet space since at least the mid-2000s. And this escalated significantly after the August War with Georgia in 2008. But these actions were always limited in scope and scale giving observers like me the impression that while Putin was committed to restoring Russian domination over the former Soviet space, he was committed to a gradualist approach. He was committed to limiting the risk to his own country and intended to push the boundaries of international law and the rules-based international order without actually breaking them. A lawyer by training, Putin has always understood the language of international law perfectly well. If you listen to his speeches justifying his aggressions over the years, it's clear he understands these principles far better than many Western leaders. He was always careful to frame his actions as a defense of international norms rather than a violation of them. His propaganda around Ukraine has attempted to do the same, but the actions speak for themselves. His attempts to paint Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and his government as a band of bloodthirsty Nazis ring completely hollow to all but the most brainwashed of global observers. Much has been made of the fact that Zelensky is Jewish, the first and only Jewish leader of a former Soviet state. This alone would be enough to render the claims that he is a Nazi laughable, but he's also the grandson of a Red Army veteran who fought in the Second World War and was decorated for bravery in the Battle of Berlin. And though he has adopted Ukrainian as his primary language, his native language is actually Russian. I misjudged Vladimir Putin. I am certainly not the only one that did that. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, to the extent that NATO countries and the collective West ever had a coherent policy towards Putin's Russia, that policy has had to be completely recalibrated. If you follow the news about the war in Ukraine, one of the points you're likely to hear from the talking heads is that Putin's invasion of Ukraine has destroyed international norms and shattered the rules-based international order formed in the aftermath of World War II by the victorious allies. In my estimation, they have that backwards. The international order was not shattered by Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Putin invaded Ukraine because the international order was already shattered. At some point, we in the West will have to reckon with our own role in breaking it. The 2003 invasion of Iraq stands out as a key step in the process. But in the short term, I think we have to first admit that the system is broken and decide whether and how we want to rebuild it. And we need coherent, unified policies that look both inward to preserving our democracies at home and outward to containing aggression by bad faith actors like Vladimir Putin. I am rarely 
if ever, going to talk in any detail about my political beliefs on this podcast, I will never use this as a platform to endorse a particular political candidate. This is a history podcast and not a political one. That said, you are, like now, occasionally going to get my takes on current events. This is because, as I've said before on this podcast, history is not just the story of our past, it's the explanation of our present. I'm going to talk in the next two to three episodes about the attempts by the Allies during and after World War II to establish an international system that could prevent the kind of tragedy they had all just experienced from ever happening again. In addition to exploring some of the roots of the Cold War in the failure of the Soviet Union to agree with the Western Allies as to what the post-war world should look like, I'm also going to examine the partial success achieved in their foundation of the United Nations. In understanding the origins of this system, whose remnants are still a part of our lives today, perhaps we can gain some insight into its strengths and weaknesses, and why, in my estimation at least, that system is no longer working. The first meeting of the quote-unquote Big Three Allied leaders that is, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, took place in Tehran, the capital of Iran, in November 1943. In a small tangent, Iran had been invaded in 1941 by the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom. The goal of the invasion was to secure supply lines between India, then still a British possession, and the Soviet Union. The king, Reza Shah, had refused to break off relations with Germany, and had several pro-German ministers in his government. The king was overthrown and replaced by his son, who promptly broke off diplomatic relations with Germany, expelled all Germans from the country, and agreed to support the Allied war effort. This invasion accomplished the short-term goals of the Allies, but it was the first in a series of events that would trigger Iran's 1979 revolution and breakdown in relations with the West. A lot of popular histories of the war written in the decades after the war when the Cold War was already a fact look back at the Big Three conferences through the lens of the Cold War and portray the main split between the Allies as being the West, Roosevelt and Churchill, versus the East, Stalin. In truth, the relationship between these three men was a lot more complicated than that. Churchill, the stalwart conservative and anti-communist crusader, distrusted and despised Stalin, and the feeling was mutual. Roosevelt was the linchpin that held the alliance together. While Roosevelt and Churchill would never have been allies in a domestic setting, Roosevelt is probably the most left-wing president in American history, but Roosevelt had been a strong supporter of Britain in the struggle against Hitler, even before America joined the war. So while their politics differed, there was a recognition of shared values between the two men, and Roosevelt's strong support had fostered a trusting relationship and even a kind of friendship between them. There was also a recognition by Churchill that he needed Roosevelt, probably more than Roosevelt needed him. I've already talked at length about the industrial strength of the United States in the context of the Soviet Union's war effort, but this was even more true in the context of the United Kingdom. Without American Lend-Lease, the British likely would not have been able to contribute to the war effort as heavily as they did. Further, while collectively they were both dwarfed by the manpower contribution of the Soviets, by the end of 1943, as America became fully mobilized in the war, the majority of Allied divisions fighting on the Western Front were American. This gap would only grow as the war went on. Churchill understood that Roosevelt was not only helping him to win the war, but that the presence of so many American troops also strengthened the post-war hand of the West against the Soviets. In light of all this, Churchill was usually inclined to defer to Roosevelt, even in situations where they may have disagreed. Roosevelt, for his part, also seems to have greatly admired the determined leadership of Churchill during the period when Britain stood alone against the Nazis, from June 1940 to June 1941. And he came to like and trust Churchill. To a point. Roosevelt, and Americans in general at this time, 
were deeply critical of British imperialism. Churchill was an ardent defender of the British Empire, and Roosevelt often suspected that some of Churchill's decisions during the war were made with the purpose of preserving and expanding Britain's post-war imperial interests rather than achieving an Allied victory. This mistrust of Churchill's imperialist intentions was certainly shared by Stalin. And so at times, when it came to deciding strategy, the Americans and Soviets would actually come together to present a united front to overrule the British. My point is that the relationship between East and West wasn't as bipolar during the war as is popularly believed. Indeed, while Roosevelt and Churchill had a relationship of mutual trust and respect, they were never particularly warm with one another. Stalin and Roosevelt, on the other hand, had an extremely warm and jovial relationship with one another. Stalin and Roosevelt were both very outgoing men and consummate charmers, especially Roosevelt. It's said that within minutes of their first face-to-face meeting in Tehran, Stalin and Roosevelt were smiling widely and joking with one another, often at Churchill's expense. Churchill wasn't amused, but he took it without complaint because he understood the utility of the warm relationship Roosevelt was cultivating with Stalin. The decisions made by the Big Three at the Tehran conference had mostly to do with military strategy, and little was ultimately decided about the shape of the post-war world other than vague aspirations. It was agreed that the Allies would land in northern France and open a second front in Europe by the spring of 1944, and that the Soviets would launch a simultaneous offensive in the east to coincide with the landings in order to prevent the Germans from transferring divisions to France to meet the invasion. Churchill was wary of a cross-channel invasion and had pushed for the Western Allies to adopt a Mediterranean strategy instead. Both Roosevelt and Stalin thought this was folly, and Churchill was overruled. The leaders discussed the possibility of dividing Germany after the war in order to neutralize the threat of them rising again and posing a new threat to the peace and security of Europe. However, the discussion remained vague. No final decision was made on the matter, and no concrete plans were laid. Stalin agreed in principle, again without concrete plan or timeline, that the Soviet Union would join the war against Japan after the defeat of Nazi Germany. Finally, the three leaders agreed in principle to establish an international organization, the United Nations. This organization, they agreed, would not only act as a forum for nations to cooperate with one another and settle disputes, but also to act as a check against aggressive actors such as Germany that might threaten to plunge the world into war for a third time. Again, the details were not hammered out at Tehran. Churchill also met privately with Stalin at Tehran, with Roosevelt out of the room, to discuss the future of Poland. Churchill signaled to Stalin that he was prepared to recognize the Soviet annexation of eastern Poland from 1939, and the two agreed that Poland would be compensated for the loss of territory by receiving territory to the west, which, before the war, had constituted the eastern portions of Germany. Roosevelt was aware of this meeting and discussion, but did not take part, as he was concerned about the perception of Polish-American voters if he were seen to be taking part in such a cynical transaction. The agreement would not be formalized and given the American seal of approval until the next Big Three conference at Yalta in 1945, after Roosevelt had secured re-election to his unprecedented fourth term as President of the United States. Before the Big Three would meet again at Yalta in February 1945, a much less well-known meeting took place in Moscow in October 1944 between Churchill and Stalin. Roosevelt was not present, and the American ambassador in Moscow was not invited. At this meeting, Stalin and Churchill had a rather cynical discussion about the future of Eastern Europe. There was no talk of democracy or national self-determination. Rather, Churchill drew up on a piece of paper a list of the countries in Europe, and next to them wrote percentages, intended to show the amount of influence the Soviet Union and the Western powers would have in those countries. For instance, the Soviets would have 90% influence in Bulgaria and Romania, while the British would have 90% influence in Greece. 
Yugoslavia and Hungary would be split 50-50. No explicit agreement was made on the status of Poland, which, as we shall see, becomes a terribly important sticking point down the road. Historians debate how much Roosevelt knew about the explicit agreements Churchill made with Stalin at this meeting. Some think he was fully briefed and acted as a silent partner, while others contend he was kept in the dark about the more cynical aspects of the meeting. I'm inclined to agree with the latter point of view. Roosevelt was what I like to call a practical idealist. He was certainly no babe in the woods when it came to real-world politics, and as we've already seen, he was more than willing to engage with more cynical politics when it was necessary to achieve his goals, but those goals were usually idealistic. He strongly believed that the war had to be fought not just against fascism and Japanese militarism, but for a higher goal. The terrible cost had to be justified by building something better to replace the old world. Roosevelt was not a perfect man, but he believed in his ideals to his core, and I think if he had known the full details of the October 1944 meeting in Moscow, he would have objected. The agreement did not reflect the values of noble nations crusading to create a better world, but of empires dividing the spoils between them. It resembled as much as anything else the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939 between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Churchill was reportedly worried about how this document would be perceived, stating, quote, Might it not be thought rather cynical if it seemed we had disposed of such issues so fateful to millions of people in such an offhand manner? Let us burn the paper, end quote. Stalin, however, insisted that the document be preserved, and Churchill thereafter referred to it as, quote, the naughty document, end quote. About four months after the meeting that produced the naughty document, in February 1945, the leaders of the Big Three came together again, this time in Yalta, a small city in the recently liberated Crimea, renowned for its mild climate and resorts. This would be the last face-to-face meeting between Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt. When the Big Three next met at Potsdam in July 1945, Roosevelt was dead and Churchill had been voted out of power. By the time of the Yalta Conference, Roosevelt's health was already declining. In hindsight, when we look at photos of the big three leaders at Yalta, Roosevelt just looks worn out. His hair is seemingly grayer and thinner than it was just a year earlier, he has bags under his eyes, and in general, his demeanor just exhibits exhaustion. By this time, it was clear to all three leaders that victory in Europe was inevitable, and would happen soon. So they met to hammer out the details of the agreements that had been left vague at the Tehran conference. They all came to the conference with different priorities. Churchill's main priority was to prevent the further spread of totalitarian communism into Eastern and Central Europe. As we've seen, He had already conceded in the naughty document to cede Romania and Bulgaria into the Soviet sphere, and he had accepted that those countries would be lost to communism. He came to Yalta determined to prevent that fate for Poland. After all, the UK had gone to war in 1939 in defense of Polish sovereignty. And though much had changed in the preceding six years, Churchill had not lost sight of that initial war aim. Roosevelt had two main priorities at the conference, to secure Soviet help in the Pacific War against Japan, and to ensure Soviet cooperation and participation in the United Nations. Above all, Roosevelt wanted the UN to work. It was to be his legacy, and the blueprint for the better world he wanted to build. It was the legacy that would make the sacrifice of the war worth the cost. Stalin's main priority at the meeting, as the leader of the country whose people had suffered the most in the war, was securing the future security of the Soviet Union. We can disapprove all we want of the Soviet regime and the brutality of their methods, especially under Stalin. I certainly have my own personal bias on this account. But in order to truly understand the Soviet 
and modern Russian perspective on the roots of the Cold War, we have to put those biases aside. The Soviet Union had suffered extremely disproportionately to the other combatants in the face of the Nazi invasion. Just 30 years before that, Russia had also suffered disproportionately in the First World War, and a mere century earlier, they had faced invasion by Napoleonic France. Each time, the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union had fended off invasion only to see their security again threatened by an invasion from the West. Stalin was determined that his country never be threatened again by aggression from the West. He couched his concerns at the conference in terms of his fears of a future resurgent Germany, but it's very likely, indeed near certain, that he believed his erstwhile allies in the Western democracies would one day be his enemies. Stalin had by this time decided that the best way to secure the security of his country was to ensure a buffer zone of friendly satellite states between the USSR and Western Europe. Since his country was based on the ideology of communism, ensuring the friendliness of these governments to his own meant, by necessity, imposing communism on the nations of Eastern Europe. Poland, in particular, was essential to this strategy, a fact that put Stalin and Churchill at direct odds with one another. The subject of Poland, as the most contentious, was among the first discussed at Yalta. Churchill was not willing to acquiesce in the imposition of a communist government on Poland, but he was forced to recognize the reality on the ground that the Red Army was in control of Poland for the time being. It would be an oversimplification to say that Roosevelt didn't care about Poland, but he was most interested in reaching a compromise so that the agenda could move on to other issues that were more important to him. He was certainly as opposed to totalitarianism as Churchill, but the protection of Poland had nothing to do with the United States' war aims, and he had no particular attachment to the London-based Polish government in exile. The agreement made in Moscow between Stalin and Churchill to recognize the 1939 Soviet annexation of eastern Poland and to compensate Poland with the addition of German territory in the West was ratified and agreed to by the Americans. As to the post-war governance of Poland, it was eventually agreed that the Allies would recognize the Soviet-backed Polish Committee of National Liberation as the provisional government of the Republic of Poland, on the condition that they agree to form a coalition with non-communist parties in a sort of unity government, and in exchange for Stalin's promise that he would allow free, democratic elections in Poland after the war. These terms were readily agreed to by Stalin. The London Poles were abandoned. Churchill's agreement to these terms was deeply unpopular in the United Kingdom and precipitated the beginning of the end of his prime ministership, though he would rise to the office once more from 1951 to 1955. Stalin's pledge to allow democratic elections would never be honored. By 1947, The Polish Communist Party had consolidated its power with Soviet support, and Poland became a one-party state. Its constitution would officially be changed in 1952, and the nation would be rechristened as the Polish People's Republic. How to deal with the defeated Germans in the post-war world was also an important topic of discussion at Yalta. All parties agreed that Germany would be divided into separate zones of occupation. The Soviets would occupy the eastern portion of Germany, while the Americans and British would have occupation zones in the west. Stalin agreed that the French, too, could have an occupation zone, provided it was carved out of the British and American occupation zones and did not affect the Soviet zone. The status of France in general in the post-war order was also a subject of great contention. It did not help matters that both Roosevelt and Stalin personally disliked Charles de Gaulle the leader of the Free French, who had emerged as the de facto leader of post-war France since its liberation from German occupation the previous year. Both Stalin and Roosevelt were opposed to France being granted equal station in the alliance alongside the Big Three, and thus de Gaulle had not been invited to join the Yalta Conference, nor would he be invited to the subsequent Big Three Conference in Potsdam. 
both Roosevelt and Stalin were wary of the British intention to re-empower France and Europe. Especially to Stalin, it seemed that Churchill's intention was to empower France to act as a bulwark against the Soviet Union. However, after Roosevelt made clear that the Americans did not intend to stick around in Europe after the war, Churchill successfully argued that France served the same buffer purpose for the United Kingdom that Poland served for the Soviets. Essentially, that a strong France was a necessary bulwark against a future resurgence of Germany. Though, in the back of his mind, Churchill was almost certainly thinking of a future anti-Soviet alliance. Despite being outnumbered, Churchill got his way. It was also agreed that Germany would be demilitarized, denazified, and dismembered. What was meant by dismemberment was left to be hammered out later, after the surrender and occupation. But there seems to have been general agreement that Germany would be divided into multiple countries somehow. As part of denazification, it was agreed that the Nazi perpetrators of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity would be given a trial and brought to justice, with a wider aim of establishing new norms of international justice and accountability. Moving on to Roosevelt's priorities, first Stalin agreed to join the war against Japan within two or three months after the defeat of Nazi Germany. In return, the Soviets would receive southern Sakhalin Island and the Kuril Islands from Japan. Sakhalin Island had long been claimed by and occupied by Russians. The southern half of this large island had been wrested from the Russian Empire in the treaty that ended the Russo-Japanese War back in 1905. Stalin wanted it back. The Kurils had never been part of Russia or the Soviet Union, but their annexation would strategically encircle the Sea of Okhotsk and allow the Soviets to claim the entire area as their exclusive economic zone. Finally, the Big Three discussed the details of the United Nations. The skeletal structure of this new international body had already been discussed by diplomats from all three countries at lower levels, and the structure of what would become the UN that we know today was already beginning to take shape. I will say more about that when I discuss the United Nations Charter next week, but for now I'll just point out where the issues that were still outstanding or that still presented some disagreement for the parties were. The first was the veto power on the Security Council. It had already been agreed that the Security Council would have the power to make resolutions that were binding on all states, including the imposition of sanctions and the authorization to use military force. It had also been agreed that the so-called Great Powers, meaning the major allied powers, would be required to act unanimously, and that therefore any one of them could exercise a power of veto over any resolution in the Security Council. One open question was exactly which countries would constitute these permanent members of the Security Council. Obviously, all of the big three would be included, and there was general agreement that China could also be included in this number, as the country that had borne the brunt of Japanese aggression in the Far East. The open question at this time really came down to whether or not France would be included. Once again, the divide on this issue is not between Eastern and Western allies, but between Churchill and everybody else. Churchill argued that France should be counted among the victorious powers because they had, together with the United Kingdom, been among the first to declare war on the Nazis, and that despite what they considered an illegitimate French government capitulating to Germany, de Gaulle and the other leaders of the current provisional government of France had stood side by side with the allies through the whole war. Ultimately, no agreement was reached on the inclusion of France on the Security Council at Yalta. It was decided that it would be left to a later conference dedicated to framing the organization to decide the permanent membership of the Security Council. Those of you familiar with the United Nations today are aware that Churchill ultimately got his way, and France is a permanent member of the Security Council. The second question that needed to be sorted was the nature of the veto power itself. Roosevelt thought that veto power would only extend to disputes and questions in which the permanent member wishing to exercise the veto was not actually involved. For example, if one of the permanent members was involved in an armed conflict with a country that was not a permanent member, the country involved in the conflict should not be able to veto Security Council resolutions 
related to that conflict. Stalin, on the other hand, insisted that the United Nations simply could not exist if a great power did not get a vote on any issue before it, especially if such an issue affected that country directly. Soviet support was too important, and Roosevelt couldn't risk alienating Stalin if he wished to see his dream realized, so he relented. The power of veto on the Security Council would be absolute. I often wonder if we might have a much better world and a more functional United Nations if Roosevelt got his way, but I suppose that's a conversation for another day. Finally, the Soviets were concerned about being outnumbered by Western and pro-Western capitalist countries in the General Assembly. It had already been decided that all nations would be represented in the General Assembly. While the General Assembly would not have the power to make binding resolutions, it would still be an important forum for resolving disputes and expressing the will of the international community. The Soviets were very concerned about potentially being isolated in this body. As a remedy, Stalin proposed that each of the 16 Soviet republics should be represented separately in the General Assembly. As a side note, there were 15 Soviet republics for most of the country's history, but during this time, the short-lived karelo finnish Soviet Socialist Republic was enjoying its brief existence. It would later be reincorporated into the Russian Republic in 1956. Roosevelt at first was unwilling to give ground on this matter, but eventually they settled on another compromise. The Ukrainian and Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republics would be allowed separate representation in the General Assembly, essentially giving the USSR two additional votes. In return, the United States reserved the right to also create two additional delegations for itself in the General Assembly to counterbalance the Soviets. The United States would never actually exercise this option, and it would become moot in 1991 when Ukraine and Belarus became independent. Thus, the big three, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, parted ways for the last time on February 11, 1945. They had made great progress in resolving their outstanding differences on the shape of the post-war world, even if they had failed to resolve all of their disagreements. On April 12, 1945, while posing for a portrait in Warm Springs, Georgia, Roosevelt remarked, quote, I have a tremendous headache, end quote. He then slumped forward in his chair and lost consciousness, never to regain it. He died of a hemorrhagic stroke at the age of 63. He was succeeded as president by his vice president, Harry Truman. FDR, for all his faults, had been a man that Stalin liked, and the Soviets felt they could trust and do business with. Truman distrusted and despised Stalin and the Soviet Union. In response to the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Truman reportedly said, quote, If we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible, although I don't want to see Hitler victorious under any circumstances. End quote. Truman would take a very different attitude toward relations with the Soviet Union. It's impossible to say whether if Roosevelt lived, the Cold War freeze could have been softened or completely averted, but with Roosevelt gone and Truman in the White House, East and West were now on a seemingly irrevocable collision course. That's everything for today. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I want to give a big thank you and shout out to the Blake Annex for providing me with this recording space. If you haven't already, I encourage you to engage with us on social media for regular updates about the show and to visit our website at www.thehistorysphere.com. If you like what you heard and you want to support the show, you can make a monthly donation through Spotify. If you don't have Spotify or you prefer to listen elsewhere, you can also support us on Patreon. The link to our Patreon can be found on the website. Next time, on the History Sphere, I will continue my analysis of the post-war order and the origins of the Cold War. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.